Muito obrigado aí pela oportunidade, obrigado pela presença e antes de começar, pois agradecer ao comitê organizador pelo convite, pela oportunidade de estar nessa mesa com tan ilustres colegas. Eu vou falar de um assunto que está em construção, estou trabalhando num, num artigo sobre este assunto e acredito que possa ser pois, uma provocação para o que muitas vezes assumimos que está bem fechado, que está bem controlado, mas que, como todo o que é feito pelo ser humano, pois, tem as suas limitações e os seus vieses. Espero poder estimular um pensamento crítico, como sempre acostumo a falar, e depois pois, me colocarei à disposição para resolver perguntas, etc. Uma primeira, um primeiro esclarecimento que temos que fazer é a diferenciação entre periodização e programação. No caso da programação, a gente, para poder entender o que é a programação, é a simples manipulação das variáveis de treinamento, frequência, volume, intensidade, etc. Então, quando isso é feito de forma isolada, a gente está simplesmente programando, ok? Daí que seja incorreto nesta literatura tão generalizada de periodização no treinamento resistido, Falar de periodização quando na realidade se estaria manipulando eh, as variáveis de, de treinamento, portanto, fazendo uma programação. Já a periodização inclui estabelecer no curto, no médio e no longo prazo uma série de objetivos que vão não só no aspecto da, da performance, do desempenho, mas também da prevenção de lesões, etc. Num cronograma, numa linha temporal que vai a respeitar o calendário competitivo. Por isso que se fala de periodização, não? de estabelecer períodos diferenciados para poder, incorporando variáveis de, de programação, eh, ajustar o que é a preparação do atleta aos objetivos que o calendário competitivo nos está exigindo em cada momento. Só que isto não é limitado só ao aspecto do treinamento, da carga de treinamento. Além da carga de treinamento, a gente tem que considerar outras eh, dimensões que são importantes para optimizar o processo, para que a performance seja ótima. Aí, portanto, temos que falar da recuperação, a periodização da recuperação, buscar aqueles métodos e aqueles momentos para acelerar ou otimizar a recuperação dos atletas, tanto entre cargas de treinamento como entre períodos competitivos. Optimizar um aspecto muito importante hoje em dia, temos essa noção, que é os aspectos dietéticos, nutricionais, para poder não só desempenhar de forma ótima, mas também recuperar. Trabalhar os aspectos psicológicos que nos vão a ajudar a enfrentar as cargas, o estresse competitivo, etc. E, obviamente, desenvolver aquelas habilidades técnico-tácticas que são necessárias no nosso esporte, na realidade na que trabalhamos. Pois a periodização de todas essas dimensões é o que conseguirá que consigamos otimizar o desempenho. Só que temos que também lembrar que nem todos os esportes são iguais. Há esportes individuais, nos que tem uma clara, normalmente, uma clara relação entre os testes, os resultados dos testes, as avaliações fisiológicas e o desempenho, no que quando um atleta está em baixa forma, está longe, longe do 100% da, das, das diferentes capacidades que definem o desempenho naquele esporte, e quando está em forma, pois, a tendência é que na maioria, se não em todas essas capacidades, o atleta mostra um perfil próximo ao 100% do seu máximo. Porém, nos esportes coletivos ou esportes intermitentes, nos que além do aspecto físico-fisiológico temos aspectos 
mais eh, relacionados con o desempenho técnico táctico, a gente o que faz é alcançar um desempenho físico, fisiológico, que permite que viabilize o desempenho técnico táctico, que normalmente é mais importante. Daí que, em vez de maximizar, quando vamos de uma fase de baixa forma a alta forma, o que acontece é que, na real, o que muda é o perfil físico, o perfil fisiológico. Okay? Não se maximiza nada, mas sim, sem poder sin ter una capacidad de predicción boa, sino que hacemos es buscar aquel nivel mínimo que nos garante un desempeño técnico táctico en aquel sport. Por otro lado, hay un aspecto que es muy frecuente, especialmente en los sports de endurance, no que es fato que el volumen es importante, más que también es sensible a la mayoría de los sports porque es contraintuitivo y es o asunción de que eh, a cuanto más treinamos, cuanto más trabajo, mejor. O famoso no pain, no gain. Y eso es mentira. La gente sabe que tiene un óptimo en la dosaje de entrenamiento que vaya a favorecer las mejores adaptaciones. Podría aquí colocar muchos eh, estudios en ese sentido, pero tenemos un eh, ben, ben simples con futsal femenino, no que te das oche de, de colaborar, un sanos, no que a respostas inmunológicas cuando son relacionadas con los parámetros de carga no muestran una relación eh, lineal sino una relación pues polinomial na que tenga un óptimo una carga entre un máximo y un mínimo no que se a respuestas son as eh, deseables por tanto a diferencia de lo que se acostuma a pensar muchas veces a más no es mejor y si tengo un óptimo de carga, no que vamos a tener las mejores adaptaciones en cada momento. Y estas consideraciones que estoy colocando a modo de introducción deben ser eh, aplicadas como que eh, la relación entre la carga y la respuesta es una relación compleja, ¿ok? No lineal, como estábamos hablando. Y esto es uno de los argumentos que utilizan aquí Renfrey y colaboradores para nos lembrar que muchas veces eh, cuando utilizamos parámetros de carga tradicionales, eh, como puede ser aquí en este caso un atleta de endurance, la percepción subjetiva de esfuerzo de accesión, o aquí en este atleta de un esporte colectivo, o TRIMP, okay, puede acontecer que a valores de intensidad y discrepantes, tenemos valores de carga, al interagir, al interrelacionar esa, ese volumen con esa intensidad, y, similares y eso obviamente no vaya a caracterizar de una forma apropiada a carga. Aquí tenemos por ejemplo un valor de 9 que nos da un valor de 180 en la carga total y aquí un valor de 2 que nos da también 180 en el caso de la atleta de endurance. Y ese mismo problema pues, puede ser observado en un esporte colectivo. Aquí tenemos un valor de 126 con 82% de la frecuencia cardíaca máxima y para una frecuencia cardíaca máxima bien menor de 73% tenemos también un valor de carga de 126. Por tanto, estas limitaciones de los parámetros de carga que usamos deben ser consideradas y inducir una reflexión en relación a si realmente precisamos usar esas otras o una combinación de varias. Y este es un problema que puede ser mejor explicado cuando eh, pegamos, por ejemplo, un caso bien específico que es a, a avaliación incremental en un laboratorio. Esta, por ejemplo, es una que hice hace unos meses con, con una atleta recreacional y no que eh, normalmente se usan criterios para determinar si allí podemos identificar un consumo máximo de oxígeno en un test que fue realmente a test austán. Entonces, cuando examinamos uh, aquel estallo, aquella intensidad, la velocidad, la potencia en la que se alcanzó el máximo consumo de oxígeno, allí se utiliza varios criterios para poder validar ese test. Ahí los clásicos son APC o consciencia respiratorio, a frecuencia cardíaca máxima y a concentración de lactato, entre otros. Y esto, claro, eh, nos, nos, faz, o nos debe de inducir una reflexión. Y, eh, aparentemente, una cosa tan simple como identificar a eh, esa está en un test para validar un, un consumo máximo de oxígeno, la gente precisa de varios parámetros para poder eh, tener una cierta seguridad, que no es certeza. ¿Y por qué falo seguridad y no certeza? Porque hay literatura, este es uno de los trabajos de esa literatura, en lo que también te ve a sorte de, de, de participar, 
Feito no campo, ok, con corredores recreacionais de endurance, con valores de 50-70 ml kg minuto, no que eh, podemos ver, por ejemplo, en cualquier caso, que aquí sí o ve plató, que eran dos criterios, ok, más, por, eh, sin embargo, o cosencia respiratoria no llegó a un punto 1, como sería esperado, a frecuencia cardíaca máxima está bien longe de la predita, por tanto, teníamos dudas si esa frecuencia cardíaca máxima es realmente máxima. En cambio, o lactato sí fue mayor de aquel valor arbitrario de 8 milimol, ok, y a PCE de la sesión, pues llegó a 19, que podríamos validar desde ese punto de vista o test. Entonces, este y los otros casos nos evidencian que no en todos los casos, en todos los atletas, aplicando criterios clásicos, podríamos validar o teste, o que nos lleva a nos cuestionar si realmente eh, eh, esos criterios que fueron eh, seleccionados a lo largo del tiempo son válidos o no. Además, cuando hacemos esas evaluaciones en no el laboratorio, tenemos aquí un, un trabajo del profesor Foster, lo que nos muestra que para a prescrición del entrenamiento traemos también un otro problema, que es que cuando la gente determina los uh, equivalentes metabólicos en no, el test incrementado para prescribir el entrenamiento, va a acontecer que cuando trasladamos esa intensidad y a un ejercicio continuo, okay, va a haber un desajuste por diferentes motivos, okay, un, un drift, un, una deriva, en la que no vaya a bater exactamente a intensidad y que hay gente quer eh, hacer o ejercicio a partir de este incremento como que realmente se vaya a acontecer por tanto habrá que hacer unos reajustes aquí en este caso se ve que tengo una cierta discrepancia y cuando colocamos esas avaliaciones en un contexto de, de entrenamiento buscando a mejorar no a largo plazo de desempeño hay un modelo que es el modelo de carga externa y carga interna que es muy válido porque, eh, como presentamos hasta ahora, tienen diferentes parámetros que pueden ser usados para monitorar o entender lo que está aconteciendo, más un modelo bien interesante y aceito, presentado aquí por el trabajo del profesor Ipelizzeri, es la relación entre la carga externa, o que a gente se manipula, y la carga interna, que la respuesta que el atleta tenga a esa carga externa y que va a estar eh, mediatizada por diferentes factores que tengan que ver con las características pues, del atleta, del do, do tipo de entrenamiento, del do, do ambiente, de la genética, etc. Só que esa carga externa, carga interna, va a tener también a ter, além de factores individuales, factores contextuales. Okay? ¿Y qué serían los factores contextuales? Pues estaremos hablando de aquellos factores que en no el calendario competitivo, dependiendo de si jugamos con rivales o competimos con rivales más fuertes o estamos en un ambiente que conocemos, en nuestro propio estadio, o jugando fuera, o clima, etc., todo eso va a mediatizar lo que acontece con la carga externa y la carga interna. Siendo que además, las supuestas adaptaciones agudas, que pueden ser positivas o negativas, teóricamente van a estar relacionadas con las respuestas crónicas que estamos procurando. Entonces, no se trata solo de avaliar lo que acontece en la relación entre la carga externa que manipulamos y la respuesta interna, que es la respuesta fisiológica, okay, como también cómo eso de forma aguda va a tener una relación a no largo plazo con adaptación crónica. Y cuando entramos en ese escenario de crónico y agudo, pues podemos también levantar determinados problemas o limitaciones. Este es un trabajo durante la Copa América de Venezuela en 2007, que acabó siendo publicado en 2012, en lo que también te la suerte de, de participar, y en lo que eh, se introdució un concepto que o, o, o el FINDEX, que sería la pues, relación entre carga externa e interna en un juego de fútbol. Aquí, por ejemplo, se puede ver que hay una cierta relación entre el percentual de frecuencia cardíaca máximo, ok, y a distancia percorrida durante blocos de 5 minutos. Estaremos, por tanto, relacionando un parámetro de carga externa, distancia percorrida durante un bloco de 5 minutos, con la respuesta interna, en este caso, percentual de frecuencia cardíaca. Obviamente, tiene un, un, un retardo 
porque não é imediato, sempre que a gente se corre, pois acaba que a frequência cardíaca demora um pouco. Só que quando analisamos o que acontece ao longo do jogo, temos aqui os árbitros e os liniers, eh, nos, na primeira media hora, tanto do primeiro como do segundo tempo, não, não tem diferenças, mas já no final dos jogos parece que tem um pioramento desse fíndex, dessa relação entre a carga externa e a carga interna. Só que aí ficaria a dúvida se realmente essa mudança tem a ver com a fadiga, isto é, para a mesma resposta interna, os, os árbitros, neste caso, percorrem menos metros, ou se realmente isso não é um artefato e poderia estar relacionado com a desidratação, que seria esperável no último, nos últimos 15 minutos de um jogo. Então, muito cuidado, porque muitas vezes, quando relacionamos carga externa com carga interna, pode haver outros fatores que não são ou não têm a ver com o efeito da carga no nosso organismo, desde o ponto de vista do desempenho e, sim, por exemplo, neste caso, desde o ponto de vista da desidratação. De fato, 10 anos depois, nesta revisão de Lima Alves, eh, Uh, o problema ainda não foi resolvido no sentido de que se estão tentando diferentes parâmetros para poder quantificar esse F-index, desde usar trimpes até usar, mais recentemente, graças ao avanço das tecnologias, as acelerações. Então, se pode mesurar o, o número, a quantidade de acelerações e relacionar isso com a frequência cardíaca e criar um diferente F-index. O fato é que estas diferentes propostas, o que nos estão eh, levantando ou explicitando é que não temos um parâmetro realmente válido quando queremos avaliar a relação entre a carga externa e a carga interna. Um outro contexto que nos pode dar também levantar outras questões eh, relevantes, e eu gosto muito deste, deste trabalho, que gerou uma série de, de artigos de Obri, orientado por Lemer, pois no que foi testado, se realmente esta, este pressuposto que muitos eh, treinadores dão por válido, que é uma sobrecarga numa fase determinada antes do polimento, ok, como um pré-requisito necessário para elevar a forma esportiva, se é realmente necessário ou não, e se esse overreaching, essa sobrecarga funcional, realmente está justificada. Pois bem, em um desses trabalhos, no que foram eh, avaliadas, registradas as respostas eh, cardíacas, o que foi evidenciado é uma coisa bem interessante, e é que uma resposta que esperaríamos que fosse a desejável de forma crónica, isto é, para uma em mesma intensidade, aqui uma corrida submáxima e aqui uma corrida no limiar de lactato, no estado de overreaching, de sobrecarga funcional, se pode perceber como tem uma queda na frequência cardíaca. Isto que significa que se a gente não soubesse que isto foi feito num período de sobrecarga, no que os atletas têm uma queda no desempenho, portanto, há que prestar atenção aos fatores contextuais, ao momento que está acontecendo, ok? Poderíamos estar interpretando isto como uma adaptação positiva, quando na real, ok, é uma adaptação que está evidenciando um problema, uma limitação do atleta para poder lidar com essa adaptação no curto prazo por conta de que não está conseguindo se adaptar ao exceso de carga naquele momento, ok? E, neste sentido, nós temos uma experiência aqui com a tese de, do professor Arilson, ok? Que teve a sorte de supervisar, no que uh, um grupo bem grande de estudantes que faziam um treinamento de sit, sprints de 30 segundos, 4 a 6 tiros, vemos aqui o perfil de frequência cardíaca, Descobrimos que aqueles que conseguiam chegar a um limiar de frequência cardíaca próximo ao máximo nos tiros, portanto, tenham uma retirada vagal maior e uma maior ativação simpática durante os treinamentos, quando comparado com aqueles que treinavam mas não atingiam aqueles valores de frequência cardíaca, sendo que todos faziam o mesmo treino, eh, que era tudo ou nada, all out, ok? Aqueles que se conseguiam atingir aquela frequência cardíaca, tinham maiores adaptações desde o ponto de vista autonómico, variabilidade e complexidade da frequência cardíaca, e desde o ponto de vista da cognição, da tensão. Portanto, temos aqui um, 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 um caso eh, muito claro, no que as respostas de carga interna, tendo uma carga externa similar, discriminaram as adaptações crónicas. Daí a importância de monitorar as adaptações eh, 
tanto no curto como no longo prazo e tanto as respostas eh, de carga externa como as de carga interna. Só que non podemos presupor que esas respostas no curto prazo sempre van a ter pois, un correlato con o que acontece no longo prazo. E este é un claro exemplo. Eh, está ben descrito na literatura que no curto prazo o consumo de creatina vai a diminuir as respostas de dano muscular. Okay? Temos aquí, no caso, as respostas agudas. Porém, cuando eh, facendo un levantamento desde o punto de vista das adaptações crónicas, parece que ese consumo de creatina non protege do dano muscular após un treinamento que induza ou, es, ou, ou teña unha carga elevada, unha sobrecarga elevada. E ah, parece que esas respostas de dano muscular están elevadas no, 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 no longo prazo, na adaptación crónica. Por tanto, hai unha discrepancia, hai un efecto paradoxal no que a creatina protege sin de forma aguda para o dano muscular, mas de forma crónica parece que o efecto é todo o contrario. Por tanto, non poderíamos esperar que teña un correlato claro entre as respostas agudas e as respostas crónicas, como poderíamos esperar nun modelo teórico. Outro exemplo desta discrepancia é o famoso treinamento complexo, no que basicamente o que buscamos é dentro da propia sesión eh, dar estímulos tanto de carga alta e de carga eh, baixa, máis balístico, para buscar unhas adaptações de todo o espectro de força velocidade, do perfil força velocidade, ok? E unha das estrategias para conseguir iso é a famosa potenciación positivación o aumento do desempeño positivación, no que primero facemos un exercicio para potencializar o exercicio seguinte, normalmente balístico, dixando un, un periodo, un tempo de recuperación. Pois ben, eso que he buscado de forma aguda para, supostamente, buscar unha mellor adaptación crónica, ainda non foi demostrado, non ten evidencia, que nos eh, demostre que realmente o buscar a potenciación dentro da sesión é o que garante a adaptación crónica e sin a mistura, a combinación de estímulos de alta e de baixa eh, intensidade, buscando eh, máxima velocidade e máxima potencia. Entón, a mistura de diferentes estímulos é o que sin garantiría a adaptación crónica optimizada e non o fato de que teña unha potencialización durante a, a propia sesión. Depois de levantar estes problemas, estes discrepancias entre carga externa e carga interna e entre adaptación crónica e adaptación aguda, okay, poderíamos tamén eh, pensar se realmente hai alguna diferencia entre o monitoramento con parámetros objetivos e monitoramento con parámetros subjetivos. E esta revisión ben provocativa, recente, de Montul e colaboradores, Nos lembra que, ainda que temos moitas ferramentas para poder facer un monitoramento de forma objetiva, con coisas que son mensurábeis e que, a principio, deberían estar validadas, o fato é que o noso organismo, cuando pedimos respostas subjetivas, okay, mediante escalas, por exemplo, eh, podemos estar evitando moitos problemas e utilizando a alta, o alto desenvolvimento tecnológico que é o noso propio organismo, que é o produto de millóns de anos de evolución, que vai a integralizar en unha única resposta perceptiva unha grande quantidade de informações que van a acontecer en todos os sistemas no noso corpo. Por tanto, as respostas subjetivas poderían, na real, sendo máis eh, simples, eh, ser mellores, eh, ter un desempeño moito mellor na hora de, de facer un monitoramento do que as respostas objetivas. Porén, Eu gosto muito da série de House e ele tem uma fala que é que todo mundo fala mentira quando avaliamos aos pacientes. Pois, muito cuidado, porque as respostas subjetivas, muitas vezes por questões que têm a ver pola dinámica do, do time, do, do clube, da competição, etc., pois nem sempre podemos confiar no que non os pacientes, neste caso os atletas, nos falan. Então, muito cuidado, ok? E, nese sentido, unha posibilidade podría ser a combinación de diferentes medidas, de diferentes escalas subjetivas, como esta revisión recente do profesor Bock, no que, ainda que non está validada, isto é unha, unha sugestión, 
ok, na relação do limiar ventilatório e do ponto de compensação respiratório, como eventos fisiológicos que determinam diferentes domínios de intensidade, poderíamos fazer uma triagem na que diferentes medidas subjetivas nos podem dar uma informação para ter mais ou menos certeza de que aquilo está acontecendo no domínio de intensidade desejável. Assim, por exemplo, se numa escala afetiva temos valores positivos acompanhados de uma fala confortável no teste da fala e de uma percepção abaixo de 11, a gente se poderia ter fortes indícios de que realmente aquele exercício está acontecendo num, eh, em uma intensidade leve. Sim? E isto, ademais, eh, não pode ser esquecido que tem uma relação entre o que o treinador pretende e o que o atleta executa. Assim, vai ter uma série de fatores nos que destaca principalmente a familiaridade, a experiência tanto do treinador como do atleta, para que batam realmente o que o treinador está buscando com o que o atleta está executando. Aqui, por exemplo, na avaliação da percepção de, de esforço entre o que o, o, o treinador prescreve e o que o, o, o atleta executa, vemos que ainda que tem uma correlação de moderada a alta, dependendo dos estudos e do contexto, pode ser muito menos ou um pouco mais. Portanto, tem uma limitação. Sim? E eh, essa discrepância entre o que pretende o atleta, ou, perdão, o que pretende o treinador e o que o atleta executa, não deve ser obviada e nos deve de motivar a buscar diferentes eh, instrumentos para poder controlar melhor o que está acontecendo. Porém, a pesar de todos os avanços que tem na literatura, este eh, artigo é, é muito, muito interessante porque nos demonstra que, quando comparado com outros métodos de predição da, 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 da mudança do desempenho dos atletas, não tem eh, ferramenta de monitoramento okay, que seja melhor que a, o próprio conhecimento do, do treinador. E aqui compararam diferentes eh, parâmetros de monitoramento, nos que pode, por, por exemplo, utilizar uma prevalidade da frequência cardíaca, ok? E verificaram que efetivamente o que o treinador predecia na hora, no momento de ver o que acontecia depois do período de treinamento com o desempenho, não havia nenhuma ferramenta que melhor, melhorasse o que o treinador, pois, com, o seu, com a sua experiência e o seu conhecimento, poderia eh, conseguir, um pouco, uma vez mais, reforçando uh, como a nossa própria intuição, o nosso conhecimento, pode ser bem válido desde que tenhamos experiência pertinente. Okay? Mas não nega que também devamos de requerir utilizar parâmetros objetivos. E isto, pois, eh, quando falamos do que acontece, dessa black box famosa, não? do input e o output no, no, no treinamento, nos leva a propostas mais modernas, como é, por exemplo, o uso da inteligência artificial, que poderia ser uma solução, eh, diríamos, bem avançada, mas que a real ainda está, pois, na, num estado eh, bem, eh, bem primitivo de desenvolvimento e que, não deixa de ter algumas limitações, mas promete bastante. Porém, eh, quando analisamos o que tem que alimentar essa inteligência artificial, neste caso falando de Big Data, okay, a manipulação, o processamento de grandes quantidades de informação, temos que prestar atenção a um detalhe, que afinal, essa Big Data, essa inteligência artificial, vai estar alimentada por parâmetros que vão ter mais ou menos validade, mais ou menos reprodutibilidade, mais ou menos erro. Aqui vemos, no caso do futebol, por exemplo, que são poucos os parâmetros, os instrumentos de monitoramento que estão em verde, isto é, que tem um mínimo de veres, veracidade, que seria a combinação de validade, a reprodutibilidade e de erro da medida, ok? Que nos dê uma certa confiança para poder utilizar no Big Data. Portanto, muito cuidado, porque às vezes essas soluções tão complexas e tão modernas tão evoluídas, que pensamos que são, por ser sofisticadas, que são melhores, na real, têm 
una grande fragilidad es que están alimentadas por informaciones que en origen tienen una adversidad comprometida. ¿sí? Como aquí, pues, el profesor Claudino nos está lembrando. Y, ya para ir terminando, lembrar que todas esas limitaciones además nos llevan a que, ainda que tengamos un plano que tenemos que implementar y que tenemos que acompañar, muchas veces, no día a día, eh, precisamos tomar decisiones para adaptar a carga, contrariamente a lo que muchos eh, hacen, que es simplemente prescriben, programan y ejecutan. ¿okay? Ejemplo clásico, trabajo de que vinieron mis colaboradores en 2007, variabilidad y la frecuencia cardíaca. Aquellos corredores que, dependiendo del nivel de variabilidad, y esto es, si estaban más estresados, más cansados, automáticamente era prescrito menos entrenamiento, pues el grupo que entrenaba monitorado no día a día por variabilidad, y, acabando eh, el periodo de entrenamiento, tenía entrenado menos, porque los días que estaban con peor variabilidad era ajustada, adaptada a carga de entrenamiento, esto nos llevaba a tener mejores resultados treinando menos, o que nos reforza la necesidad de tener herramientas para no día a día avaliar ese, esa prontidad para el entrenamiento y poder adaptar a carga de día. Eso también puede ser feito en el caso del entrenamiento resistido, aquí a propuesta de Brian Mann, en relación al entrenamiento autorregulatorio, en lo que, haciendo las primeras cargas, podemos verificar cómo es el estado atleta y a partir de ahí adaptar o qué efecto nos está en la sesión, o okay, entrenar más o menos dependiendo de cuál es la nuestra respuesta a las cargas en la, en la, primera, en la primera parte del entrenamiento, o mismo, otra vez, el profesor Claudino, con uh, o salto, que es una herramienta bien simple, okay, o salto vertical, y que aquí nos demuestra cómo eh, a media de desempeño de salto puede servir para verificar el estado de fatiga, por ejemplo, mejor que usar, por ejemplo, un mejor salto de varias tentativas, ¿ok? Y este trabajo clásico, usando pues, esta escala de Hooper, que originalmente fue utilizada en un macrociclo competitivo en Natasound, no que utilizando varias dimensiones, misturando diferentes valores pues, de sono, estrés, fallega y dolor muscular, se desenvolve un algoritmo que nos da un score que nos puede dar una idea de cuánto eso nos puede estar avisando de que el atleta está entrando en sobrecarga o sobretrenamiento y por tanto deberíamos de tomar decisiones para a partir de esas informaciones en este caso son subjetivas pero podrían ser eh, más objetivas como las anteriores poder tomar decisiones no día a día para poder ajustar a carga de entrenamiento pues bien, después de levantar toda esta problemática, estas limitaciones entre carga interna y externa, eh, respuesta aguda, respuesta crónica, y como todo eso nos debe de estimular para buscar soluciones no día a día, aquí estaría un poco sintetizada la idea de la propuesta de lembranza en que nos, en cada contexto, no nos exporte con nuestra metodología de desempeño, deberíamos de contextualizar cuáles son los factores de desempeño en nuestro esporte, okay? en qué nivel dentro de una población estemos, no es lo mismo trabajar con hombres, con mujeres, que con adolescentes o atletas máster, y obviamente considerar todo eso pues, con cuestiones que tengan que ver con uh, aspectos contextuales, como puede ser ya no solo estado de terreno de juego, o, o si jugamos en casa, etc., como también aspectos tan simples como la temperatura, la humedad, etc. ¿Ok? En el momento de entrenar o competir, vamos a tener que considerar tres dimensiones, la prontidad, el propio ejercicio y la recuperación, y para eso tenemos diferentes instrumentos que deben de estar validados y deben de tener una reproductibilidad y un error que sean aceptables para que sean más o menos complejos, ayudarnos a tomar decisiones antes, durante y después de la carga de entrenamiento o inclusive de la propia competición. ¿Ok? Lembrando que por ser complejo no vaya a ser mejor. Tengas veces medidas bien simples como escalas que nos pueden dar informaciones perfectamente válidas, bien integrativas, más que no caso o que deberíamos buscar que en cada contexto a, a, a instrumento que usemos sea válido, ¿ok? Reproductible con poco ego y que combine medidas objetivas y subjetivas que nos ayuden a tomar esas decisiones. Por ejemplo, 
eh, no cometamos el error de coletar demasiadas informaciones y tener una abordaje que no sea tanto eh, eh, direccionada por los datos como auxiliada por los datos para poder tomar las decisiones basadas en nuestra propia experiencia ¿okay? y conocimiento. Y todo eso dentro de un plano que busca los objetivos determinados, tanto en el nivel micro y en el nivel macro, una visión más holística, para poder tener una dirección, encajar las pesas de este quebracabezas. Entonces, esa sería un poco la llamada de atención para que en esta complejidad ya intentemos contextualizar, usar poco más válido y eh, no nos dejar dominar por muchos datos y sí con los que son eh, suficientes y pertinentes en aquel contexto, ayudarnos a tomar las decisiones no día a día. Muy obrigado por la atención, espero ter estimulado y ayudado en algo en su actividad y en su proceso, sea estudiantes, profesionales, etc. Okay, y me coloco a disposición para responder a las preguntas que consideren oportunas. Muy obrigado. My name is Professor Carl Foster. I'm from the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. As you can see from the brief introduction to me, I'm, I've done a lot of things in the past, which means I'm very old, which means historical ways of looking at problems is very important to me. And so the, the, the talk is about the history of, of monitoring training. Next slide, please. Training is like cooking. If you're gonna cook a meal, you need good ingredients, you need a recipe, You need a cook who's willing to taste the soup as he prepares it. And with any luck, the, the cook will come up with a nice tasting meal at the end. Similarly in athletics, you need uh, a talented young athlete. Uh, you need a coach who has a plan. The coach has to observe the athlete as they're preparing and see if they're making progress. And with any result, uh, such as with Sebastian Coe here in the 1980 Olympic Games, uh, you wind up with a gold medal or a world record performance. Next slide, please. Training is fairly simple. You warm up, you do some sort of conditioning bout and scientists spend a lot of time thinking about how to do conditioning bouts. And then you have a cool down. Next slide, please. There are several basic principles to training that regardless of the sports you're preparing for are in common. <clears throat> They are represented here in this dose response curve. The uh, blue line is the uh, response to training in terms of the things you want to happen. Uh, it's, a, it's a negatively accelerated curve at the top. The red line is the things you don't want to happen, the side effects, the injuries, the illnesses, overtraining and so forth. Depending on the type of person training, uh, you fit a certain place within this therapeutic window. For example, a patient with chronic diseases, uh, the side effects might be catastrophic, you might die. And so you, you accept smaller effects. Athletes at the other end of the continuum in the green are willing to accept a certain amount of risk of injury uh, to achieve the highest possible performance. And in, uh, in middle-aged normal people like Daniel and myself uh, fit into the orange thing where we accept a small risk of injury uh, for a uh, slightly reduced uh, potential uh, effect. The, 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 this, ther this therapeutic window is based on the volume of training and the intensity of training. Uh, and it can be expressed as load, which is a mathematical construct where you put together frequency, time, and intensity. And of course, specificity is quite important because uh, a strength trained athlete would not be expected to be very good at running marathons. Similarly, a marathon runner would not be expected to be very strong. What you want to do is achieve the effects, which in sports is related to the level of performance while minimizing the side effects. And particularly in athletes, you want to make sure you don't get a side effect uh, the, the week before the beginning of the World Cup. Uh, Ideally, the term prescription is based on some sort of evaluation. It can be done in the laboratory using standard laboratory methods, but there are a host of methods that can be done in the field. 
which allow the, the coach to uh, decide where to start the training and when to progress the training. Next slide, please. Some of this data will be talked about by Franco in this uh, same session this afternoon. If you've not read his 2019 paper, I strongly encourage you to do so because it sketches much of the background of, uh, of what we know about training. Next slide. So where did the idea of training come from? The earliest data I think that anybody refers to is Milo of Crotona, who was a young farm boy in the south of Italy, who for some reason his father, who was a farmer, uh, had a cow that foaled a bullock and Milo picked it up and carried it around the barnyard. And for reasons that are lost to history, he continued to do that every day. And the bull was growing and growing and growing. And eventually Milo became very, very strong. He went to the ancient Olympics, which at that time was over in Greece, because this was not the contemporary Olympics, but the ancient ones. He won the wrestling competition in six different Olympic games. He finally lost to somebody who figured out a technique that could match his strength, and he went on to become a great military leader. From this, we have come up with several basic principles of training. Uh, I use an anagram called PP Roids. You have to urinate to pass a doping test. And if you're taking steroids, then you get caught and disqualified. But it relates to several different elements of training. Uh, Milo, of course, discovered the, the concept of progression of training. Uh, but there are others that are just as important. And then the anagram that's also important to understand is how you describe training, frequency, intensity, time, and type of training. Next slide. Now, in more contemporary times, the first concepts of monitoring training came out of Scandinavia. In the 1920s, uh, Pavel Nurmai and Hannes Kolomainen uh, used to run carrying stopwatches. Now, it's been lost to history of whether they were practicing pacing or whether they were monitoring how fast they ran their repetitions. Uh, but in any case, they had some sort of quantitative method of, of doing that. Uh, a little bit later in the 1930s in Sweden, Gösta Homer came up with the idea of fartlek or speed play, where athletes would go to a course, usually out in the woods, and run the course. And if they ran uphill or they had an area they liked, they would try to run harder. If they had, a, if they got tired, they would run easier. Sometimes their dog would be their pacemaker. It's not very uh, consistent. You can say, well, I ran five kilometers or I ran for an hour. Uh, Professor Borg would not be around for another 40 years. So the concept of perceived exertion was at best a construct in the back of people's minds. But they had a way of, of training and a way of recording it, but it wasn't very precise because measuring intensity was difficult. Next slide. Next slide. The other problem is specificity. This is a, a Gunnar Hogg and Ani Anderson, who in the 1940s ran a, a great series of one mile races. Now, if you're running on a track, you can measure speed, you can measure a lot of things, but in Sweden, for six months of the year, the weather's rather substantial. And so they would still go out to train, but how do you monitor your training when you're running in snow up to your knees? You can say, well, I ran for an hour, but is it hard? Is it easy? Uh, time is pretty meaningless because depending on the snow, you don't go very fast. So it's not very specific. Next slide. The next attempt to really get a little more specific also occurred in the late 1930s. Uh, Voldemort Gerschler and Hans Reindel in Germany uh, came up with the idea of interval training, where you would run somewhere between 100 meters and 400 meters. You would try to run to a heart rate of 180. Why he picked 180 is lost to history. You would then try to recover to 120. If you couldn't recover in the appropriate time, it was perhaps the, the time to, uh, to stop that workout and go home. Uh, the idea was brilliant. It, it led to great successes. And so uh, it was a, an appropriate way to do things. However, their physiology was probably entirely wrong. If you look in the lower left of the image, you see them testing uh, an elite runner 
on a supine cycle ergometer using a radiography to try to look at the heart volume. Now, if a runner is running upright, uh, what does that have to do with cycling in the supine position? They came up with the concept that the heart got bigger in recovery, but it, we know now that in an upright position in recovery, the heart can only get smaller as venous return uh, uh, decreases. And so they came up with a brilliant concept, the right result, but they had the wrong idea about why it occurred. The other thing, next slide, is they were running to a heart rate of 180 and recovering to a heart rate of 120. But this was in 1939. We did not have electronic heart rate monitors. If you've ever tried to palpate your pulse, which contemporary people probably have not, uh, measuring a heart rate of 180, which is three times per second, is very hard to do with any degree of accuracy. And uh, if you're trying to do this after 100 meter repeats, there's almost no, uh, no time to do this properly. So again, they had the right idea and they came up with a concept that worked extremely well, but the physiology was really all pretty well screwed up. Next slide, please. The same concept of interval training, however, got popular. And even though everybody recognized that heart rate was not a very useful method, uh, they recognized that times for repeats were fairly useful. And so by the 1950s, Franz Stampel, who was a, uh, an Austrian, who moved to England after the Second World War and wound up coaching Roger Bannister to the first sub four minute mile, came up with the concept that you might do a workout like running 10 times 400 meters, starting a new one every three minutes. And in October, you might start running for Bannister fairly slowly at 66 seconds. And every month he would try to run the workout faster. So he had the concept of an index workout. And then the idea was across the training year, you would run faster and faster and faster. Well, this is a good idea, but in England, it's cold in the winter, it's wet, it's windy. Uh, the running conditions are very uh, unconstant. And yet they tried to do this. And it's, there's a general rule of thumb that uh, amongst the track athletes that what you can run for this workout is the time you can run for one mile. So if you, you can progressively try to get to where you can average 60 seconds and then you should be able to run a four minute mile. The other interesting thing in this phenomenon is that somewhere about March, Stample realized that his athletes were no longer progressing. They were no longer getting better. Uh, we didn't have the word overtraining in those days, but they were probably approaching overtraining syndrome. So he being the brilliant coach he was, sent them on a hiking vacation for 10 days. He said, boys, I don't want you to run. I don't want you in your track shoes. Just go out and hike and drink beer and enjoy yourselves. When they, when they came back to Oxford to start training, they began progressing again. And a month and a half later, uh, Bannister broke four minutes for the first time. Uh, this same concept had been, has been applied in the U.S. by B Bill Bowerman at the University of Oregon, who uh, is actually the person who created Nike uh, shoes. And he had the concept of date pace, what you could run today, and goal pace, what you wanted to run during the competitive season. And across the year, you would try to run faster and faster and faster. But it's still based on some sort of interval workout that uh, is convenient. And in Bannister's period of, of history, almost every workout was an interval workout. Uh, now they're probably only running two or three interval workouts per week. Next slide. Monitoring got better in the mid-1980s. Uh, Polar came up with the idea of a, a, a telemetric heart rate monitor that you could download to your computer. Uh, the accuracy of measuring heart rate went up enormously. The ability to record and analyze it afterwards went up enormously. Uh, shortly, about the same period of time, uh, portable lactate analyzers became available that allows you to sample lactate, not from venous blood samples, which is rather complicated, but from a fingertip. And so you could do it several times in the middle of the workout. Yellow Springs Instruments in the United States, who had one of the first uh, desktop type lactate analyzers, came up with this nice little commercial that the lactate analyzer could in fact be the coach. All you had to do was give it a hat, a, a whistle and a stopwatch and a lactate analyzer and you had a coach. 
Now, anybody that knows anything about training knows that it coaches a lot more than a lactate analyzer, but it still came up with the idea that we could use technology to provide information that guided training. Next slide. So we've come up with the idea, which is still in current use of the lactate profile. The nice thing is you can do it in the laboratory, you could do it in the field, and then you can allow athletes to do workouts that are very specific to them, such as a speed skater who's walking in a sort of a crouch position up a hill. They call it low walks, and it mimics speed skating. But you can look at the growth of lactate, which is nonlinear. You can look at the growth of heart rate, which is somewhat linear, measured at the same time. And if you pick, for example, markers of lactate like two and a half and four millimolar, uh, you can define heart rates, which are much easier to measure and can be done continuously. And if you look to the upper right, you can see a heart rate tracing that is related to what went on in that workout. And you can give a sense of whether it, it's in which training zone it's in. Next slide, please. So how do training and performance interact? What you do is you're for an athlete, you go out for a run with your friends and sometimes you run faster Sometimes you run slower, sometimes you go shorter, sometimes you go longer. But the intent of all of this is what happens when you get to the track. And this is a picture of Eamon Coggling during the 1983 uh, 5,000 meters at the World Championship. It's one of the greatest pitchers in sport because at this point, he's 110 meters from the finish and he knows he's already won. He's passing the Soviet athlete who had been leading and he knows there's no one to beat him. And so whatever he was doing and however his coach was monitoring training, by definition is right because he's winning and he knows he's winning even before the finish line. Next slide. The real sort of breakthrough occurred in the late or in the mid 1970s, early 1980s uh, by uh, Eric Bannister from Canada who came up with the idea of the training impulse or the TRIMP. He observed, and again, the data was collected only on him and uh, the other guys who worked in the lab. These were not elite athletes. But they would go out every day at noon and have their run, and they would measure their heart rate with their polar monitor. And you could see that if you look at the two graphs at the top, the, uh, the height of each, of each run, the, the impulse of that training, during the early part, the training is harder, and then they taper, uh, and, and, and they get more rested. And these are two different people showing that training can be recognized to be highly individual amongst different people. As you train harder, your fitness goes up, but your fatigue also goes up. And so in some cases, your fatigue can overrun your fitness, and your performance might actually decrease. But then as your training decreases, the trims decrease, Fitness goes down, but fatigue goes down more rapidly. So for a certain period of time, performance has increased. Now, they came up with a fairly complicated way to do this mathematically, but the concept of it was fairly useful. They even came up with that idea of, of how many days it might take for you to have easy training to achieve peak performance. And so the idea was conceptually brilliant. It was just hard to execute. Next slide. And so his contributions was, he looked at training intensity, adding it to training duration. Because it was a bunch of middle-aged laboratory workers, they were looking at only for the average percent of heart rate reserve, which really ignores interval training. Uh, they corrected for nonlinearity with a uh, mathematical construct that makes conceptual sense, but it's hard to get at independent, but it also depends on heart rate uh, dependency. For example, runners or cyclists, it's a fairly useful method. Uh, at the time I was working with a bunch of speed skaters who, if their heart rate could be 300, it would be, but it can't be. So they do a lot of interval training, a lot of very high intensity training. And so the banister process was limited, even though conceptually it was right. But then the trims came up to be the summation of intensity and duration and frequency. And then they came up with this idea that fitness and fatigue interact, what they call influence curves, to define performance. Next slide. 
So one of my challenges when I saw this, and literally when I first saw the papers that, that a couple of his students published in the early 90s, I hit myself in the head and said, wow, this is brilliant. The problem is it was too complicated. If I showed this to a coach, they'd ask me, if the, you know, you got to be kidding me. I was already working with a perceived exertion scale with my patients, and I had gotten used to using the newer, the category ratio scale that Borg had created. And one day after my own workout, I was sitting in the laboratory in exactly the posture of this. And I'd done a workout and I said to myself, wow, that was hard. Now you have to remember that the Borg scale is meant to say, how do you feel at this moment? What we did is we, tr we translated that saying, how was the whole workout? Almost on the same day, my kids came home from soccer practice and you say, how was your workout, honey? Because that's what you say to your kids when they come in. My kids said, oh, the coach made us run and run and run. And I almost threw up and I hate soccer and, and I wanted to take music lessons. Both of my sons are fairly good musicians. So we thought, wow, they just gave us a verbal descriptor that was rather long that fits with the Borg scale, which fits with the number, which fits with intensity. And what if I multiplied that by duration? Do I have the same information that, that Bannister did, but in an easier way? So we went to the laboratory. We had people do a bunch of workouts. We asked them how was their workout using a Borg scale. And it turns out it correlates pretty well with the heart rate reserve, which is the best heart rate method to use. We did the same thing looking at lactate. If, there, if their session RPEs were low, most of their lactate uh, results were below two and a half millimoles. If their session RPEs were high, most of their, their, their lactates were above four millimoles. And if they were sort of intermediate, we had an intermediate result. And so basically, we if we said session RPE times time gives us trims, and this is the same as Bannister's heart rate times his, his special factor to make a nonlinear thing, it seemed to work fairly simply. And all we had to do was say, how was your workout? We also found out that it was somewhat mode independent. We could do running, cycling, walking, even non-specialist weightlifting that you do as supplemental training seemed to fit pretty well. And it seemed to fit for a lot of different things. And we published this for the first time in 1995. It wasn't for a few years until people realized that it sort of worked. Next slide, please. You can use session RPE in a simple way. This is like a training diary. On Sunday, I go out and I run for two hours. I call it a four, which is somewhat hard. And I get a certain TRIMP score, which is the multiplied factor of these. The next day, I have a 30-minute workout at a moderate intensity. I get less points for it. The next day, I go for a very hard interval workout. I get points for it. At the end of the week, I get a certain number of points, a certain amount of improvement. The training load is higher. Now, we'll talk about monotony and strain later, but uh, suffice to say, this is a variability day to day, and this is the likelihood of having a bad training outcome. And so we can calculate the things we want. You can even express this visually and say, well, I can see my periodization plan. I've got three pretty hard days and I've got four pretty easy days, which for an old guy is an appropriate way to train. Next slide, please. We I, I work with speed skaters who fortunately are not very smart. Uh, think about somebody who goes out in their underwear when it's uh, 15 degrees below zero and skates around it at, at 50 kilometers per hour. You're going to freeze. It, it, a smart person does not do this. Anyway, so we got some speed skaters and talked them into coming into the lab. And fortunately, speed skating and cycling have a lot in common. So I put them on this bike I had and they would do 10 kilometer time trials. And from the spring when they were just starting their training at about 500 units per week, which is three or four days a week of a 30 or 40 minute workout. As they went across the summer and the fall, they trained harder and harder and harder. We brought them into the lab and their performance got better and better and better. And of course it follows the saturation curve that we expected. We did not plan on this happening, but it turned out that in our sample, if they trained from early season to late season and the training load was 10 times bigger, their performance or their power output was about 10% better. 
So it, it follows a, a, a logical curve and it fits with some reason. And, and this is how all training goes. We just happen to be in position to quantitate. Next slide, please. The same idea was followed by Steven Seiler, who at the time people were somewhat enamored of lactate. And the, the idea was that if you trained sort of in your, in your lactate threshold range, uh, that you might be training in an optimal sort of way. Uh, and uh, so S Stephen went up to the north of, of Norway with a bunch of Norwegian junior skiers who were very, very good. And he hung around with them for a couple of months and he measured every training load. And whether it was heart rate or session RPE or lactate, he found that 70 to 80% of training was uh, done at a fairly easy intensity. They're racing at about this intensity here, just about their second lactate threshold. And so even though it's somewhat nonspecific, they selected this fairly easy training, but they also selected some hard training. Steve came up with the idea of polarized training where you do more training here, more training here, and actually in the most specific range, they do comparatively little training. And so there's been some a lot of discussion and a lot of literature. I refer you to some work that we did in MSSE last year. There's a four paper series uh, where we essentially we had an argument with uh, Andy Jones and um, M Mark Burnley. And uh, you can do polarized training, which fits about this amount of training, pyramidal. And this was theoretically the best kind of training. But it turns out athletes just simply don't do that very much. It's probably better to look at days. In other words, if you're training 10 times per week and you want to do 80% of your training in the polarized way, about eight of those workouts should be below the fir first lactate threshold. If you're, uh, uh, if you're trying to do uh, pyramidal training, which may be what people are in fact more doing, you have seven workouts per week that are below the first threshold two that are between the thresholds and 10 above this threshold. Now, why do you need to, to manipulate training intensity like this? Number one, if you train at high intensity, you get inflamed, you get tired, you get autonomic downregulation. If you're going to get non-functional overreaching or overtraining syndrome, this is the doorway that you go through. But if you're gonna race, you have to promote type two motor unit recruitment. And to do that, you have to train at somewhat higher intensities. Next slide, please. So then we ask ourselves, do athletes in fact execute the training plan? This is These are a bunch of speed skaters. This is Eric Hyden, who in 1980 won every single medal that was available in speed skating. That's like Usain Bolt winning the marathon and the 100 meters and everything in between. Next slide. This is Stan Kwiatkowski, who was a Polish national, who was a U.S. coach in the early 90s. <clears throat> One day, the athletes came in and said, Stan, Stan, we're so tired. We need a day off. We're going to get overtrained. We need some more recovery. And Stan says in his unique language, if you makes recovery, when I gives recovery, you not once days off. And I hit myself in the head again. I spend a lot of time doing this because... Other people do brilliant things, and I realized they did brilliant things. So we went back home. We got a bunch of athletes on the track team. We asked them to do a bunch of training and to record their training. But we also asked the coach, what did you have in mind for that training session? And on days that the coach thought was going to be quite easy, that were intended for recovery, the coach had almost nothing. The athletes always trained harder to a person. They trained harder than the coach wanted. But when the coach wanted to train hard, the athletes always trained less hard. Now, in physiology, if you train hard, you're disturbing homeostasis, you're turning on protein synthesis, you're making the body change in a way that's going to make performance better. But the athletes are too tired because they're too stupid to recover on the days that the coach wants them to recover. We've done this experiment eight different times with different types of athletes from basketball players to, to cyclists, to speed skaters, to runners. Every time we do the experiment, it comes out the same. Athletes don't know how to recover, which means they can't really turn on protein synthesis when they want to. Next slide. 
in the 90s, also, we were interested in overtraining syndrome, where you sort of lose your Zoom. Racehorses get a similar phenomenon called off their feed syndrome. In other words, they don't eat properly. They kick their stalls, they bite their hand and they can't run. Well, if I don't run a good race, who cares? My girlfriend cares. My kids maybe care. I care. Nobody else on the planet cares. If a horse runs badly, a lot of people are losing a lot of money on racehorses. So Harriet Brown in the Netherlands got some racehorses. He got a big horsey treadmill so he could measure their performance. And he started training them hard day, easy day, hard day, easy day. This went on for several weeks. The horses got better. You're supposed to get better. Then he trained them harder and they got more better. Then they trained them even harder and they got more better. But notice the saturation curve. And then he said, well, we can't train any harder on the hard days. Let's take away the easy days. And immediately they deteriorate. So we understood that overtraining syndrome is a phenomenon of poor recovery, not too much training. But we realized that what was happening here was the variability from day to day had decreased. We called it monotony, monotony. It's the weekly mean of training divided by the standard deviation. Don't ask us how we measured uh, uh, training intensity. The horses did not stamp the ground as, as to give us an RPE score, but we could use heart rate. If you multiply the trims times monotony, you get strain, which is the likelihood of something bad happening. So to, to be successful, you have to have a high training load, but you have to have a low strain. And you've got to stay within that window. Elsewise, you don't perform particularly well. Next slide. Three minutes. So as we went forward with this, uh, Harm Kuypers is a physician in the Netherlands who had done a lot of work with overtraining syndrome. It also happens he was world champion in speed skating. Uh, and he, I was talking to him one day, he said, if I can't sit down, which is a specific thing in uh, speed skaters and getting down into this position they skate in, it's time to go home. So we, we realized, and, and Jose Rodriguez Morroyo came over from Spain and he had done some similar work with uh, people who had completed the Vuelta a España. And we came up with the idea that if you did a warm up, that if the RPE during the warm up was a certain level, then you were doing what you wanted. If the RPE during the warm up got bigger, maybe it was time to take a day off. Maybe you couldn't sit down. Alternatively, if the uh, if the RPE during the warm up went down, maybe it was time to increase the training load. So in other words, you could fail the warm-up. That's what Harm found. That's what Jose found. Next slide, please. So Jan Lemur has come up with this nice little cartoon, which he tends to do. He says, okay, we have a plan. We have a recipe for making the athlete. And so the athlete's going to do the training. We're going to monitor the training load. We're going to taste the soup. And then we're going to see if they perform. And then we turn around and say, well, how did this go? And we go around and around and around the circle. But instead of waiting till the championships to see how performance went, we could do it every week or even multiple times per week. Next slide. So there's several principles of training. Number one, you have to relate your monitoring method to performance. In other words, if you're doing squats, don't expect it to tell you anything about being ready for running a marathon. Uh, you have to look at both whether external or internal training is appropriate. Within an athlete, either a percentage of heart rate or an RPE is fine. You can also look at an absolute performance because it's within the same athlete. But if you're looking between athletes, you have to have some way of normalizing out uh, the uh, talent factor. Uh, for Franco's talk later, we'll tell you a lot about that, I'm sure. So you also have to look at the relative effort required to monitor. If it's very complicated, if it interferes with, with a workout, coaches are not going to be accepting it. And we have to realize that as sports scientists, coaches are driving the bus, and so we have to, to play in their game or whatever. Uh, there are several, you also have to look at the ease of monitoring. There's several easy ways to do it. Some questionnaires, how do you feel today? The best one out there is Michael Kelman's Rest Q, uh, which is fairly easy to use. You can look at index performances, but performances imply very heavy training or very heavy loads, which is going to interfere with the workout. 
and coaches are not going to be accepting of things that interfere with their workouts. However, if you make the workout your index, such as 10 times 400 meters on a three minute send off, which is appropriate for middle distance runners, you still get the workout, but you can look at the average time. And so now you have a monitoring technique. You can do either physiological feedback, heart rate or lactate or so forth that are fairly easy to, to measure and, and download. You can use psychophysiological measures such as rate of perceived exertion or affect. Uh, those are also fairly good. And RPE happens to be really, really simple. I've done a lot of work with this, so obviously I like it. The big story is how long does this take to get feedback? If you get feedback to the coach the next week, you're going to be there one time and the coach is never going to talk to you again. If you can do it in the next five minutes and help the coach make decisions about do we do the normal workout today or do we do a harder workout or do we do a lesser workout, the coach is going to like you. If the result is something beautiful scientifically, but the coach is going to look at it and say, you got to be kidding. I can't figure out what to do with 20 different athletes in the next five minutes. The answer is no, and it's completely useless. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Uh, this is my cat. He's named Chicken. He helps me do most of my writing. In the United States, chicken means two different things. It can be a word for a bird that's tasty. Uh, I th in Italian, I think it's polo. I don't know what it is in Portuguese, but probably something similar. It can also mean that when you're a 10 year old boy and your friends are wanting to do something and you're afraid to do it, they call you chicken. Well, my cat is chicken because he's afraid of everything. But I thank you very much. Hello everyone. And thank you for attending this presentation. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for their kind invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here and trying to share with you my experience, knowledge and opinions about training load. I start immediately with a question. Why are we interested in training load? This is an important question that, and, and actually it's a question that you should ask yourself every time you, you are interested in a tool, instrument that is supposed to help in your work. I think you agree that the optimization of training is one of the main goals. And probably you heard this in other presentations and uh, it's possible that you also read in several papers uh, because this is the way authors try to um, support the practical meaning on their findings. So in studies uh, um, around training load, it's quite typical to find in the conclusions that the findings can be used to optimize training. However, this is a bit too vague and we need to ask ourselves also what does optimize mean? And uh, the answer is very important because this can provide us the framework uh, to interpret the f not only the, finding, uh, the findings of the studies but also to understand how to uh, use the measures of training load in, in, in our practice. So it's, uh, it's uh, quite implicit when we use the term optimize that we are referring to uh, a causal context. So normally what we want to do is to manipulate the training load in order to change the response of interest. So uh, normally we want to change the training load and we hope that this will change the, the performance or for example, the risk of injury. Um, so the, when we want to alter the likelihood of an, of a future event by manipulating a variable, what is needed is that these two components, these two variables are causally related. If we look at the definition of causation presented in a textbook of epidemiology and in a famous text of epidemiology, uh, we can define causation as the potential for changing an outcome by changing the cause. So in the context of the training process, we want to understand the potential for changing 
the um, performance or uh, risk, risk factors for injuries by changing the training load and its uh, contents. If we want to approach the problem from a causal perspective, first of all, we need the causal structure. A causal structure is uh, basically a representation of the causal relations between elements of the process, in our case, between the elements of the training process. And this can be done uh, using, for example, causal diagram, which are the one that I'm going to use uh, in this presentation. And you have to interpret this as a causal assumption. So in other words, as our causal hypothesis, uh, trying to explain how training load may determine um, improvement or changing in performances or um, risk factors for injuries. We can, we can learn a lot of things from other fields. And one field where uh, probably sometimes we don't even know, but from where we uh, have borrowed a lot of terminology and also methodologies is epidemiology. If uh, we look again in the same textbook and, and, and we look for the definition of exposure, we have two definitions that I'm going to use uh, uh, during uh, this presentation. So the first one is a variable whose causal effect is to be estimated. So you can already understand why I want to use this definition, because this is exactly the context uh, of optimization. A second definition is the amount of a factor to which a group of individuals was exposed. As I said, we need a causal structure. So we need to understand the role of each factor in, uh, that we can measure or uh, that we can imagine uh, have an effect in our training process. In epidemiology, um, there is a, um, a connection between exposure and outcome, and this connection is normally causal. So one of the goal of epidemiology is to find, uh, to determine what are the exposures that are determinant of, a, of an outcome. When they develop uh, causal structures, uh, the relation between exposure and outcome uh, is never a, a straight relation. There is also something in between. And when we study the relation between exposure and diseases, we need to understand the role and what are the other factors that can influence the, the, um, the process. So for example, normally the exposure uh, acts on the outcome through mediating mechanism. So there are mechanisms that are initiated by the exposure to, to something. The, pro the problem is that this relation is not straight. I mean, there are other factors that can influence this relation. For example, there are the so-called effect modification, which are variables that alter the relation between exposure and mediator, or, or better, they alter the effect. So the effect of the exposure on mediator is different um, in relation to uh, some variables. For example, um, sex is, is one of these uh, variables that can modify the effect. And there are effect of modification in each of these paths. There are other factors that we sometimes we know and we measure, sometimes we don't know that are the so-called confounders. So um, these are variables that confound the effect between an exposure and an outcome or between a mediator and an outcome. If I don't know these confounders, uh, I may find a relation which is in reality not due to a causal effect of the mediator to the outcome, but because there is the intervention of a, a so-called third variable. Just to give a practical example, so you immediately understand what I mean, is like when we try to establish a causal association between the number of ice creams sold and the number of shark attacks. There is a relation, and the relation is confounded by temperature and seasonality. So, using the same approach, we can start to um, to explore the the training load uh, area, uh, trying to define what kind of association we can have between the external load and the performance. So in this case, uh, the way external load inf influence performance uh, is through the internal load and through um, intermediate outcomes. So basically, uh, uh, 
to, to provide an example that makes this uh, uh, clearer. Um, if I, uh, I design a, a program based on resistance training, this resistance training that I'm, uh, I'm, uh, um, to which I'm exposing the athletes will induce uh, an internal response. The internal response may be um, neuro, a neuromuscular response and also uh, initiate, for example, uh, biological pathways that will lead to hypertrophy or things like that. And the reason why I do this is because I want to improve some physical characteristics, in this case strength, that I suppose to be related to performance and specifically um, positively related, which means I increase the strength and this can increase the performance or let's say injury risk to, to use another outcome. The, the strength uh, uh, or this physical characteristic uh, can be also used as an intermediate outcome. Sometimes I cannot measure the performance, so I measure the effect of a, on an intermediate outcome. Of course, uh, I need to be sure that this factor is, uh, is a factor influencing performance. As for exposure and outcome, unfortunately, I have a lot of other factors that can contribute uh, to alter the effect of the external load on internal load, the internal load on another mediator and so on. And these effects are the one that we try to present, for example, in the, in the adaptation of the original framework that we proposed 15, 17 years ago. Another concept that you, you need to consider is the nomological network or nomological framework which is a, a framework that identifies key constructs associated with the phenomenon of interest and the associations among these constructs. So basically, a nomological framework or a nomological network is the theory uh, that I develop that connect the elements of the process uh, that are supposed uh, to explain a phenomenon. And you can see here uh, immediately that I have highlighted the, the, the term construct. And this is important because a, a key element of this framework is that it includes constructs. So since I have constructs, I have to define them in order to understand their role within the process. And this is something I can do, for example, developing a taxonomy. Um, the, the where, there was a recent paper uh, questioning the use of, of the term load and another paper that um, has addressed uh, some concepts related to, to the training load. Um, I, I don't spend too much time, uh, I don't enter into the details because I don't have time today, but uh, this is our um, answer to the authors that have uh, um, initially in their paper have uh, um, suggested that the use of training load uh, is not scientific uh, and we have shown here uh, using arguments from philosophy of science and the methodology that is absolutely appropriate and if you are uh, interested you can find a more point uh, point to point point by point response in this preprint that is freely available but um, just to, to use those papers uh, to, to explain why um, basically the reason of this presentation is that it's not rare to conflate uh, the constructive or descriptive definition with uh, the operation definitions. And I will try in the next slide to explain what these two uh, concepts mean. Um, another problem is that we, we use several times the term exposure and dose, but not necessarily we really know what these uh, terms uh, mean uh, uh, in, the const uh, in the context from which we have borrowed these terms. So the, the first point, as I said, is uh, mixing up these two, uh, the descriptive and the operation definition. So I try try to explain you that there are three components uh, when we talk about constant that we have to consider and eventually to develop. The first one is the label. So we need to assign a name to the constant. 
in order to understand what we are talking about, we, we need a, a term to, to identify this, uh, this uh, object of our conversation, let's say. So in terms of, uh, of um, a training process, uh, the train load is the label that we have assigned to a multidimensional construct. So that's the name of the construct. Once you have a name, we need to understand what this name uh, means. And this is uh, what um, is done by the constitutive definition or descriptive definition, which is a theoretical definition that gives meaning to the concept or concept under investigation. So, uh, in again, within the training co uh, pro process context, uh, um, a training load uh, is a higher order constant. Higher order means a constant that um, uh, that include other sub dimensions, uh, reflecting the amount of physical training that is what is actually done and experienced by the athlete. So this is the constitutive definition. But once I have the constitutive definition, normally we need also, both in research and practice, we need to quantify this, uh, this concept. And, and here is where I need an operational definition. So an operational definition is a series of operations and, uh, and uh, procedures that allow me to transform this uh, theoretical uh, constant, which is a training load, in, in a something uh, that I can use for the analysis of, or to quantify this, uh, this, um, uh, this construct. Um, of course, uh, if you think about training load uh, being the amount of physical training, there are a lot of ways to quantify the amount of physical training. And that's why it doesn't exist a, a, a unique and a, a single definition uh, operation definition, but there are a lot of definitions, and each definition define an aspect of uh, uh, this amount of physical training. the the other the, the other misunderstanding quite common in the sports science literature is about the meaning of exposure and dose. And this is just an example from one of, of the papers that I mentioned in which the author wrote that a further way of differentiating the dose from the amount of training is by characterizing the training load as either internal or external to the athlete. Um, you see there is a, a, a part which is um, uh, underlined and the reason is that the, it's, it doesn't make a lot of sense to write that you can differentiate the dose from the amount of training because as I will explain you the dose is exactly the amount of training. And this, uh, um, we have written this uh, in, a, in a paper that is under revision. Um, this paper, uh, the preprint of this paper is available on uh, Sport RX IV. And if you um, want to know more, you, I invite you to, to read and eventually also to send me some feedback that they, uh, would be very appreciated. So, uh, in uh, occupational and environmental epidemiology and other areas like pharmacology and toxicology, um, the, the, uh, there is this kind of classification that, as you will see, is very uh, similar to what we use in sports science. So, in, in, in some areas of epidemiology, because there is plenty of areas of epidemiology, and each area try to uh, adapt the, these definitions to their context, but uh, uh, this definition was very uh, useful for us to show the parallel with epidemiology. So exposure to an agent, uh, the, um, as, as I uh, show you in, uh, in the second definition in the previous slides, is the amount of a factor to which a group of, of individual is exposed. So do we expose someone to something, and this is something is called factor or agent. And uh, a factor or an agent of exposure is uh, can be everything, can be nutrition, can be behavior, for example, uh, training or physical activity are behaviors. So I'm exposing, for example, an athlete to a behavior, and I, I'm interested to understand the what this behavior will will uh, cause in in, uh, um, in in my athletes, in my individual. So the amount of a factor is the exposure to an agent. But in in this definition, the um, in these areas, uh, 
the exposure um, is divided in two components and these are called external dose and internal dose. The external dose is the, um, is, is the amount of, of the agent external to the body uh, to which we expose the individuals. Instead, the internal dose is the portion that enter is internally absorbed. So the, the key concept here is that I expose someone to something, this something will enter in the body or will change something in the body and is the change internally to the body or the amount of the exposure within the body that will determine the response and the, the response is just a quantification of a, a biological effect as I, i'm sure that you, you have already seen the, the similarity with sport and exercise science where we have training load which act as the exposure to an agent where the exposure is the load and the agent is training and uh, similarly includes two components the external training load and the internal training load again the external training load is the agent is the behavior that induce and cause an internal response but as you know the res the, the response to the outcome uh, is uh, influenced by the internal response indeed if you um, if, if you design a a program and you ask to 10 artists to do exactly the same let's say that the program involved running to uh, at 20 kilometers per hour you know that these 10 artists running at the same speed will have different internal responses and this can be influenced by different factors including how much they are trained their level their physiological characteristic genetic characteristic and so on so basically in this classification the external dose or the external load act as a distal cause so is a is a the cause of the internal load like the external dose is the cause of the internal dose and the internal dose is a mediator of the response so the way that the external dose exerts an effect on on a biological system is uh, dependent on the internal dose the same is for the external training load. The way the external training load affect performance is through the internal load because these two factors are the one that determine adaptation or biological changes. So as, uh, as I showed you before, training load is the exposure to an agent. So training load is also the dose, the internal and external dose. So we cannot differentiate training load from the dose or from the exposure because they are they are the same thing in other words the agent to which we expose people is training and with the term load we mean the amount or the demands uh, of this training so load is not used in its mechanical sense and despite someone is not happy about that um, I think that you have to live with this because this is the way that load is used in several fields cognitive load, allostatic load, viral load, mental load these are just terms used in other areas, scientific areas where load has no mechanical meaning it's just a way to indicate the load and the demands and similarly uh, the other, the other uh, suggestion was that the definitions uh, should uh, abide to the international system of unit again this is wrong because they are not the definition that should abide to the international system eventually are the measures that are derived from the operational definition that should abide to the international system of unit but not necessarily so once I define the concept I needed to define the process and give a, a role to this concept in the causal in the causal path leading to an improvement potentially of the performance. So this uh, this uh, comes back to when we start uh, when we propose the classification 
uh, dividing the uh, training load in internal and external because we did not simply provide a taxonomy so a definition and just for the sake of it but we try to provide a tentative nomological network based on which we can uh, derive causal assumptions and make our uh, develop our causal hypothesis so we everything started uh, in a paper published in 2005 uh, two years after we presented the same contents to a conference uh, uh, it was the SCSS conference in Salzburg and by the way that was the conference where I first met uh, Carl Foster and I, I remember I was very excited because Carl was and he is one of the giants of, of sports science when we presented that uh, framework is in the context of the assessment of aerobic training in soccer and the reason why we we presented that framework is because we we needed to find a way to define the measurable components of the aerobic training so we proposed this framework in which as you can see there there were these two at the time new terms used in the scientific literature in reality external internal load um, have been used previously in the coaching literature even if not defined the way we have defined but the term these two terms were already around uh, in in the coaching literature but anyway um, we propose uh, this framework because as you can see here there are elements that can be measured so i can measure the external load and can measure the internal training load i can measure the training outcome and the way we we we, we did that in the paper it was using physiological assessments so the key messages of that framework was that we wanted to define the measurable components so proxy or surrogate measures of the element of the training process in addition we wanted to start to underline the role of the internal load so the role of the physiological responses which is something we don't see it's more it's easier to measure the external load the the, the speed the velocity the power uh, um, so it sometimes we focus on what we see while we forget that something that we don't see is happening therefore the internal load in that framework act as a mediator of the of the effect of the external training load on the outcome which is exactly the same as I presented before for for uh, uh, that is used in, uh, in epidemiology we more recently we have uh, uh, presented a better explanation of that framework because in reality in that paper we haven't really elaborated the concepts and this uh, happened after basically 15 years we presented the first time that that framework in 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 this uh, explanation we uh, added uh, other components uh, and, and specifically the performance the determinant the training goal the reason why we introduced these other three elements is because at the end uh, what i have done in the in, in this year was something uh, that i use as a coach and i wanted to be useful to other coaches in their practice so uh, in this framework we just wanted to um, remind people that you need to define the training goal the training goals by understanding the determinants of the performance and these determinants are the intermediate outcome so we just completed the the, the, the training process and this is also the way you define the the program you are going to prescribe more recently as as said we 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 try to clarify some concepts providing more definitions and but we also wanted to add elements that are important but were not included formally in the framework and by formally i mean we didn't explain exactly the role of additional elements of the training process for this reason in this uh, uh, framework that we published uh, one or two years ago I don't remember um, we added the two uh, um, two new components the training effect and individual and contextual factors these are the, the these uh, individual and contextual factors are for example elements 
that can be confounders or affect modification of the training process. And the important thing is that you need to remember that these factors can influence all the other elements of the process. So the individual contextual factors may affect the external, internal load, the, the training effect, and the performance outcomes. Another characteristic that we wanted to underline is that the training effects are always a combination of acute and chronic effects, and these effects can be negative and positive. So the, they, they are a sort of uh, uh, um, interaction between these, uh, these elements. So what measure of train load we use based on this? In epidemiology, the, in, in a causal framework, the measure of exposure should be measure of mechanism of action for the agent and disease of interest. So uh, the, the, the me mediating mechanism are the target for defining the measures. So in training load is the same. The measure of training load should be measure that reflect the mediating mechanisms. I provide you a, an example. So uh, small sided games are sometimes used uh, to improve football performance because, for example, the effect they can have on sprinting or agility, let's say. And while this is relatively clear, we have to define what are the mediator of these relations. So why small sided games should improve sprinting? And one reason may be that the, uh, uh, the small sided games may stimulate the neuromuscular system and this uh, stimulus will improve sprinting or agility and football performance. So this is the mediating mechanism. If this is the mediating mechanism, I need a measure and I can say, okay, let's measure the speed above uh, 25 or high speed because high speed is what determine the neuromuscular stimulus that will improve sprinting, okay? Uh, we, here I use the example of speed, but someone may say uh, accelerations. The more number of acceleration or the more the, the acceleration at above a certain level, the higher the neuromuscular stimulus and therefore the sprinting. After that, I should define a metric. So what we need, uh, because this is a theory, this, sorry, this is a, an hypothesis. What we need as researchers is to verify all these links to understand if these are reasonable and if the data that we collect confirm this structure. And of course, we need also to understand if there are other pathways, causal pathways and so on. This is just to say that first, I presented this as an example, not because I think it's right, but because this is, I know this is uh, the underlying assumption of, of uh, a lot of application of small sided games. Uh, and as from a research point of view, what I'm saying is that this is what we need to do. If people use this kind of uh, structure, cause a structure, we need to test whether this is right or wrong. So, um, as I said, once you have the measure, you have to define the matrix. I go quite very quick here because the time is almost finished. So I have two kinds of measures uh, or matrix, uh, static and dynamics. And this is a list of potential static measures. I will not focus on, on, on dynamic measures. And they just present you this uh, cumulative exposure formula, which is used in epidemiology, which is basically the calculation of the area uh, the, of this black area. Simply simplify the, the formula. This is uh, uh, basically correspond to multiply the intensity by duration. And again, you can, can imagine immediately why this is a measure of cumulative exposure used in epidemiology is similar to what we use as a cumulative exposure of a training load in, uh, in sport. Because if you measure the intensity with the RPE and you multiply by duration, you obtain the so-called session RPE, which is the methods uh, <coughs> proposed and validated by Foster. If you use uh, uh, intensity, you measure intensity with heart rate, uh, you can obtain the training impulse. Or if you calculate the volume, as the ICSM has suggested, you again multiply the intensity by duration and you have another measure of, uh, of cumulative exposure. So all these measures are measure of cumulative exposure. As in uh, epidemiology or in science, uh, some authors have underlined that this measure can, be can have some limitations and uh, that's 
that's uh, absolutely sure because uh, the um, the use the combination of this uh, of intensity duration may uh, not um, uh, communicate the better uh, way um, communicate in, in a proper way the role of intensity and duration uh, the separate role of intensity and duration and there are other models that take into account the time bearing nature of intensity but as I said I don't have time today so in conclusion uh, training load is a bidimensional construct so is a, a, a higher order construct that includes the two subdimensions these subdimensions are the internal and external load the external load uh, is uh, is uh, what causes the internal load and therefore these dimensions are causally related the internal load is a mediator of the effect of the external load on the response on the outcome in addition training load classification uh, remember uh, a classification resemble a classification that also is also used in epidemiology and i'm underlining this uh, just to say that uh, if it makes sense in epidemiology i don't see why it shouldn't make sense in in uh, uh, sports science and in addition the measure of exposure that you need to control and to monitor the training process should be measured that reflect mediators so when a company proposes you a measure the question that you have to ask is what mechanism this measure that you are proposing uh, should reflect and what uh, what are the evidence of this relation and uh, uh, all the causal relation that i show you should be demonstrated and should be supported by evidence i just finish uh, 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 talking uh, 30 seconds about prediction because this is important remember that prediction does not necessitate causation which means that the variables that they are using a prediction model are not causally related to the outcome they may be but we have no idea whether they are causally related so even if training load is included in prediction models and even if the prediction models are, are uh, uh, works and are good uh, but I can say that there are no prediction models that have been properly validated you don't have to interpret the features of the model as causal factors so if you modify the factors included in the prediction model you are committing uh, an error from a methodological point of view but also from a substantial and pragmatic point of view the, the possibility the probability that we you will change the outcome is very is very small Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.